So I can tell you I'm very excited about this sermon today because it gives a different perspective. Today, I want to talk to you about some very important doctrines of the Bible. Some truths, if you would. Some things that you can hold on to and you can know for a fact. Now, we understand that the Word of God is God's Word to us. And God used men of the Bible through the Holy Spirit inspiration to give to us the very words of God. In that, when we read the Scriptures, we can understand what the Scripture says through the influence of the Holy Spirit. So, when we're talking about the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are all trying to communicate the life of Christ. And every one of the Gospels give a brief description of this one event called the baptism or the inauguration of Jesus. The inauguration is when he is starting his life, starting his earthly ministry. Early on, when he was 12 years old, he was at the temple and his parents couldn't find him. And he finally told his parents, I must be about my father's business. The Bible is quiet from that point on until this issue of baptism. He's off the scene. He's growing up in stature and favor with God and man. He is not a baby God. He is Jesus, the Son of God, taking off his deity, being 100% man and 100% God. We don't understand it, but we understand that Jesus was the Son of God to came into this world for a purpose, and that's to redeem mankind from their sin. So when we're looking at these Gospels, we're looking at there's a particular purpose, and that purpose is the inauguration or the setting of the next three and a half years of Jesus' life. We look at the cross, and we see Jesus died on the cross three years later, and we say, what a wonderful picture of our salvation. And the cross is the picture of our salvation. He died on the cross for our sins. But we see in the baptism that John the Baptist said, this is the Son of God that takes away all the sins, the perfect Lamb of God. So it's not just the crucifixion that is important to Jesus. It is the life of Jesus that is important to God. The life of Jesus that is perfect, without sin. So Jesus lived 33 years without sin because he's the perfect Lamb of God. He took off his deity, being still God, put on his humanity, but being led through the Spirit, lived a life that could be your sacrifice. Let me put it this way, in a, in a clearer picture. When God looks down and he sees you, and he sees your life, and he sees your sin, and he sees your issues, if you're a child of God, do you know what God sees? Jesus' life. He sees the perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. But when God looked down and looked at Jesus, what did he see? You. Because when he was hanging on the cross, he took the sins of the entire world upon his shoulders. So the perfect Lamb of God became sin for you that he could be the propitiation of the covering of your sin and mine so we could gain access to heaven. So it's a doctrinal issue. So when we're talking about the baptism of Jesus, I want you to look at some of the wording that Jesus is, is being used in here because it's so important. So the watermark, what is the watermark? The watermark is a mark of quality. It is used at banknotes, passports, and postage stamps and other documents to prevent counterfeit. It is to prevent counterfeit. It is what God chose to mark his believers as true disciples of Christ, unashamed followers of Christ. He even showed it to the point that he even had Jesus go through baptism so he could say, we're starting a new covenant, a covenant of faith, of Jesus instead of repentance of sin. We're going to get into that. So let's look at the four Gospels. I want to read these because they're, they're very important. Let's start first with Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, verses 21 
and 22. It says this. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized, and while he prayed, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove upon him. And the voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Well, we look at that, and we say, Man, there's a lot of stuff going on that verse. This is a complete picture of what the Trinity is all about. God the Son being baptized, God the Father speaking, and the Holy Spirit descending. It's the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit instantaneously at the same time we're in effect of the baptism of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit descending from heaven, resting upon Jesus. He lived his life in his humanity, but he was absolutely controlled by the Holy Spirit in his actions. And that's where we should be. We should allow the Holy Spirit of God, the umption of God within our life, to control us in our everyday action. Just as Jesus did, so should we. And I like what it said here. It said, when all the people were being baptized. In other words, John the Baptist was proclaiming the message of the Gentiles to the Jews, and they said, there's going to be a Messiah coming. If you want to see the Messiah, if you want to see God, you must repent of your sins. Repent, turn away from, and look towards God. They were being baptized by the groves. John the Baptist started his earthly ministry about six months earlier, and he was empowered from his baby's womb to be led by the Spirit. He had a purpose within his life. He was led by the Holy Spirit his entire life to this point. So when he proclaimed the message of the coming Messiah, the power of God was upon his life, and hundreds of people were being baptized, repent of their sins because of the coming Messiah. But now when you go to Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, a different perspective. Matthew chapter 3 says this, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan. That's about 70 miles. That from, the, from, from Nazareth to Galilee, they didn't take a bus, they walked. 70 miles to get baptized. Sometimes we don't even go across town. Sometimes it's not important to us. But Jesus knew his inauguration event. He was going to be baptized in front of the crowd. And he knew that this was going to start his earthly ministry. Then Jesus came to Galilee to John in the Jordan to baptize by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so, for this is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up and immediately from the water he behold, the heavens were opened to him and saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And suddenly the voice of God from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So John the Baptist looked at him and said, You're my relative. My mom told me that you were the Messiah. I know that you were conceived of the Holy Spirit. We celebrate that at Christmas. And I know that you are the coming Messiah, and I know that you are sinless and you are perfect. And John the Baptist said, hey, I try to do good, but I sin. I am not perfect. I am not worthy of baptizing you. And Jesus says, allow this to be true for the fulfillment of all righteousness. Righteousness. That God is going to use the event of baptism to start this transformation of the repentance of sin upon baptism to the relationship of Jesus through baptism. So when we become a believer in Christ, we identify ourselves in Christ through baptism. It's so important. It's not about being baptized for the remission of your sin. It's not, how many times can I get baptized? I feel like I've done something wrong, so, Pastor, can I get baptized again and again and again because I have sin within your life? You have to see that once you identify yourself with Christ, the baptism is your identification into the family of God. It's to fulfill all righteousness. It's to allow God to be your leader and your love. 
It's not about your sin because Jesus has already died for your sin. You got to remember that when Jesus looks at you, he sees his forgiveness and he sees his love and he loves you unconditionally. That's to fulfill all righteousness. And then let's look at John, John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him. They, he was baptized yesterday, and this is the next day. And this is what John the Baptist said. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Thus he said, of whom I said, after he comes, a man who is preferred before me. For he was before me. I did not know him, but he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing him with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. And he remained on him. That's important. He remained on him. I did not know him, but he who sent me baptizing with water said to me, this is God. God sent him to baptize in water for the remission of your sins. He said, those who sent me, upon whom you will see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified this to be the Son of God. The descending of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus after baptism is the confirmation of God that says, this is my Son whom I'm well pleased. This is the Messiah. Follow after him. Take your lead, John the Baptist, and you decrease so Jesus can increase. And instantaneously, once John the Baptist baptized Jesus, his influence fell off because he allowed Jesus to be exalted. And whenever we have influence, whenever we have a life, we should always try to exalt the name of Christ and allow Jesus to be glorified in everything that we do. John the Baptist did that, and so should we. But the Bible says that, this, that the Spirit of God descended upon Jesus as a dove. Not necessarily a dove, but as a dove. It was a, it was a manifestation. It was something real. The crowd was watching him. It wasn't something supernaturally that took place that nobody could see because John saw it. So it was an evident action that the heavens were open, the dove descended, or the Holy Spirit descended, and rested upon Jesus, and then the voice of God spoke. I love what he said. This is my son, who I am well pleased. Well is a meaning of, I have been pleased with him from the past, and I am going to be pleased with him for all eternity, because he is fulfilling my plan. What is that plan? That plan is the first step of the redemption of your sins and mine. The Father knew at this point was starting the work that Jesus, through the influence of the Holy Spirit, was going to have power over all sin, was going to have power of all humanity, all elements, but at the end, his power was to defeat sin and death. That's the ultimate power. And Jesus, when he was being baptized, the Holy Spirit rests upon his shoulder and the voice of God speaking, this is my son, whom I'm well pleased, knew that this was the event of all creation was coming to a climax right here. And that climax was going to be that his son was going to live for another three years. And he's going to take the sin of the entire world upon himself. And he was going to die a cruel death for you and me. But that's the only way that we could have access to God is if there was a perfect lamb, a perfect vessel that knew no sin, that became sin for you, that could have access to heaven. And it started right here through this inauguration or this baptism. And then let's look at Mark chapter 1, verses 9 and 11. And I want to give you a few points. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then the voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There's three simple points that I believe that we can look at 
of Jesus' baptism to find out whether we have the mark of God upon our life, the watermark. Now, let, let, me, let me clarify what baptism is and what baptism is not. Baptism is an identification into Christ. It is saying, I have a faith in Jesus. I know that Jesus died on the cross. I know that Jesus lived a perfect life, and I have accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And because I have accepted him as my Lord and Savior, I would like to publicly profess my baptism or my identity into Christ. I am not embarrassed to get soaking wet in front of a bunch of people to let people know that I have faith in Christ. Baptism is my identification through humility into the death, the burial, and the resurrection, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ to walk in the newness of life, in what I believe. I believe in the principles of God. I believe in the fellowship of Jesus. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if I accept him as my Lord and Savior and I've been immersed in baptism, then I'm identified into Christ. I am not ashamed to say I'm a child of God. That is what baptism is. Baptism is not. It used to be when John the Baptist baptized before Jesus started a whole different time frame of covenant, John the Baptist's baptism was, I have sinned, so I must get baptized for the remission of my sin. You don't have to get baptized every time you sin. A lot of us would just live in the bathtub, wouldn't we? Okay, so <laughs> you just would. We don't get baptized every time we sin. Our baptism is into Jesus, into the body of Christ. It, it, is, it is a picture of what Jesus Christ has done for us. But sometimes we, in our mindset, we think, well, if I sinned, I must not be identified into Christ. Well, we have the, the nature or the flesh within us that's going to cause us to sin. But we also, just as Jesus had the Holy Spirit upon him, once we gave our life to Christ, we have the Holy Spirit that lives within us. We have the ability to live a life that crucifies the flesh and to live in Christ. Now, how do we know that? It's because Jesus had that same ability. He, if, if I could picture this for you, Jesus took off his deity. 100% man, 100% God. But Jesus did not sin. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. This explains it perfectly. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Therefore, since we have great high priest who has gone through the heavens, a Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith he professes. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Yet was without sin. When Jesus took off his humanity, he was tempted, just like you and just like I, but being fully empowered by the Holy Spirit, his life was living through the power of the Holy Spirit. The evidence of his life was he was totally engulfed with what God wanted him to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. We have that power once we have given our life to Jesus Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit comes and takes residence within our life as soon as we give our life to Christ. We have the Holy Spirit of God. So the first thing that I want to talk about is our identity, our identification. How do we identify with Christ? You have to look at what the first thing in Luke chapter 3 is said that all the crowd was being baptized. John the Baptist was baptized in the multitudes. And Jesus came with them to be baptized. Jesus at this time was one of the crowd. He was the son of God. He, he, he knew no sin up to this point. He was 30 years old. He didn't sin. But he came from Nazareth to Jordan to be baptized by Jesus, to be baptized by John the Baptist in the crowd. And after they were, it was just like any other baptism. John the Baptist would baptize, he would baptize. But this, baptize, this baptism took a whole different picture. 
John the Baptist looked at him. Oh, I, I, don't, I can't do this baptism. You should baptize me. And Jesus said, oh, this is for a purpose. Let this be. And when John the Baptist put Jesus under the water, and he came back up, and the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him, and the heavens opened, and Jesus said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. It was an identification, a testimony to every person in witness and for the scriptures to us to identify that this is the mark of the start of Jesus' ministry. Jesus was baptized in order to start the ministry, the inauguration of what he was getting ready to do. The application is this, is once we give our life to Christ, we want to start our earthly ministry, we want to use the Holy Spirit within our life. The first mark is, am I willing to be humbled enough it's not about me. It's not about what I can do. It's about, can I be humble enough to say, I'm going to identify with Christ. I'm going to put myself in the body of Christ. I'm going to put myself in the baptism. Now, baptism is not, I'm going to get baptized in this church, and I'm going to get baptized in this church, and if I go to a different denomination, I've got to get baptized into a different denomination. The Bible says there's one baptism, and that baptism is in Jesus. Okay? It's not into a denomination, it's into Jesus. And when I get baptized, I get baptized into the fellowship of Jesus Christ. And in doing so, I join a church so I can have fellowship with him. But I don't have to get baptized into a different denomination or a different fellowship because my baptism is securely placed in my faith in Jesus. And once I've been baptized into Christ, that is my baptism. I know I'm secure because it is the mark within my life. So... I want to identify with the crowds. Jesus wanted to identify that I, I am here to be just like you. And I am here to save all of you. So the first thing was identify. The se second thing was to exemplify or to be an example. To be an example of what we need to do. There's never a picture in the Bible ever that somebody was baptized before they had the encounter of Jesus Christ after this point. After this point, the baptism was not for the remission of their sins. At this point, and this point alone, the baptism became a point of baptized into Christ. Identification into the body of Christ of my faith in him. It's an example. And uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 3 again. And it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized to you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for this is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. For us to fulfill all righteousness. John the Baptist is trying to say, You're perfect. But if I baptize you, the crowds will think that you are a sinner. And that you have to repent of your sins in order to see the Messiah. But you are the Messiah. It's how, why would I want to baptize somebody that's perfect, that's the Lamb of God? If I baptize you, the crowds will think that you're no different. And then Jesus says, Shh, John, do what I ask you to do. Just do it. And then he said, okay. And then he baptized him. And then, Wow. The heavens were open, and the voice of God, this is my son, whom I'm well pleased. What a bigger confirmation could anyone have? The Holy Spirit descended upon him. So John the Baptist, in his finite mind, thought, I can't baptize you. But Jesus, in his wisdom, said, oh, let it be so. Let God's glory to be shown. So when we get baptized, when we say, I want to follow after Christ, I want to have a watermark within my life, we can say, you know what, I don't want to do that. I don't want to get wet. I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't know if I can live a perfect life. I don't know if I'm going to walk sinless. You're not going to walk sinless. You are going to have issues within your life, but your identification is that somebody that loves you, that holds you, that's going to walk through you, that you're identified with him for your security. There's not a greater joy 
when I know when Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I accepted him as my Lord and Savior, from that point on, when God looks at this rotten Bruce Thomas, he doesn't see the junk within my life. Give me an amen. You know what he sees? The perfect Lamb of God. That takes legalism out of the picture. That takes works and do, and you have to be a certain way out of the picture. God doesn't want us to sin. The Bible says, God forbid. But what he wants us to do is humbly come after him and identify with Christ and live your life pleasing unto him and be led by the Spirit because God loves us unconditionally. And if you struggle with your identity, you struggle with your sin, you struggle with, am I worthy or does God love me? You have to look that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and God loves you unconditionally. He loved you so much, he transferred all of your sin into Jesus. And he punished his only begotten son for your sin. So his life from the birth to his death was perfect. The Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the world, that's you and me. And then he just asks us in this to let him be an example, to follow after me. If we are Christ-like ones, if we are Christians, if we are supposed to be followers of Christ, if we are supposed to be disciples of Christ, the first example that Jesus told us that we should follow after him is if I have a faith in Jesus, if I have a concrete relationship with him, if I've been forgiven of all my sins, I should not be ashamed to follow after Christ in believer's baptism. Why is that? It's because it's a mark. It is a mark that when you are up there and you have an audience of four or 500 people watching you get soaking wet, it's not pretty, especially for you women. All your makeup's running and, you know, it's just not a pretty sight. But you know what? It's a gorgeous sight in the eyes of God. What are we looking at? Are we looking at man or are we looking at God? It's a pure relationship with God. It's Jesus was our example. He was our example to the body of Christ, not to be ashamed, not to worry about what the crowds thought. Let Jesus be glorified. And if we allow Jesus to be glorified in all of our life, that's when Christ can be manifest. Now, the last one, and there's only three points today, can you believe that? Is to be anointed. Is to be anointed. Let's look at John chapter 3, verses 34 and 36. John chapter 3, verses 34 and 36. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. In other words, he has, he has the full measure of the Holy Spirit of God. He, he Everything he does is through the power of God, through the Holy Spirit. Every word that he said, every thought that he had, it was the full measure of the Holy Spirit within his life. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So, the anointing. Jesus was anointed by God. When we believe in the Son, we shall have life and have life everlasting. We will be anointed by God through the Holy Spirit within our life. The anointing means set apart, consecrated for a purpose. And Jesus was baptized, his baptism was anointed by God to let everybody know that this is my Son whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit descended upon him and rested on him. When we give our life to Christ, found in John chapter 3, it said this, He who believes in the Son hath everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. The word is life. Everlasting life, everlasting power. If we have Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have the power to defeat sin. We have the power to understand that I am set apart for a purpose. It's not just for my pleasure, it's for God's will. The anointed one, the title gives a chosen, consecrated, equipped for an office or for a purpose. And if we understand that we are anointed by God, when we have been given our life to Christ, and Christ has set us apart, 
we have a purpose. And that purpose is to fulfill God's will, to be marked as one of his children, to say, I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. It's not about, we're going to have a baby dedication here in a little bit. And that baby dedication, we don't baptize babies because there's no identification into Christ as a child. The identification of Christ is when every child or every person comes to the understanding, I know that I'm a sinner and I need Jesus for my forgiveness. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and accept him. Then we will baptize somebody because then and only then that they have the understanding that they are set apart for a purpose and their salvation is by God. Not by mom and dad, not by baptism, not by false security. It's all about Jesus. And then in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, it says, As Jesus began his ministry, he stands up in a synagogue and reads from Isaiah the prophet, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the prisoners and recover the sight to the blind, and to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus had a purpose. He had a purpose, and that purpose was to be anointed by God, to take away the sins of the world. Taking Jesus, taking Jesus at what he did, he was baptized to start his earthly ministry. And the application of the watermark for my life and your life, there's many of you that have been baptized many times. You've been baptized into different churches. You've been baptized because you thought you were saved as a child and you got baptized again as an adult. You've been baptized two or three different times. And you know what? That's between your testimony, between you and God. I do not know when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, but God does. But all I would tell you is if you want to start and you want to be faithful to God and you want to say, I want to start my ministry, I want to start God's favor within my life, I want to be led by God within my life, the greatest place that you can start after your salvation experience with Christ is to say, I am not ashamed to be identified with Christ in the body of Christ. It is the mark of authenticity. It is a mark of not being a counterfeit. I don't care what the crowds say or what the crowds think. What I care about, am I faithful to my Lord? Am I honoring to Him? Will I be faithful? to submit myself to Jesus under his authority to say, Lord, what's next? What's next? What do you want me to do? Because after Jesus was baptized, you know what happened? The Spirit of God that rested on him sent him into the wilderness. He fasted for 40 days and then he was tempted by the devil. Which I'm going to tell you, the next step after baptism when you identify into Christ and you accept him as your Lord and Savior, and you may have great communion with God, but let me tell you something, Satan gets chapped when you start following after God. And that's why a lot of people say, you know what, I just want to blend into the crowd. I want, I want to be saved. I want to be part of the body of Christ. But this, this whole baptism, consecration thing, this whole getting on fire for God, that's just an invitation for Satan just to kick me in the booty, and I don't want it. Guess what? That is exactly where Jesus wants you. He wants you to rely on him in the midst of adversity. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He didn't go in there on his own. He was led by the Spirit. And I guarantee you, if you are led by God to do certain things, you are safer in the arms of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit in the midst of adversity than you are in the church house on a Sunday morning around Christian folk. Why is that? Because God wants to protect you. God wants to wrap his arms around you. God wants you to be in his will, doing great things. How do you do that? Submit yourself. Just saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? What? I don't know what's next. The first thing you have to do is accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And many of you have done that. And the second thing after salvation is saying, okay, I want to make it public. 
I want to start my inauguration. I want to start my life. I want to not be ashamed that Jesus is my Lord. I want to stand up in front of the body of Christ and say, Jesus is my Lord and I'm not ashamed of him. And then, and only then, is I believe what God would do for you is the same thing he did for his son. He looks down and he said, I am well pleased. Because remember when Jesus died on the cross, God looked at him as you. But when God looks at you, he sees him. This is my son. This is my family. I am well pleased. Why? Is because they're faithfully, humbly doing what I ask them to do. Then ministry. Then life. Then Jesus, through you, can take a whole different vehicle, a whole different avenue of fulfilling God's will within your life. Let's go to Lord and pray. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we thank you for this watermark. We thank you for allowing us to understand that we need to be faithful to you. And Lord, today, as we look at the first step of salvation and the second step of baptism, put it deep within our hearts, a commitment that we can nail it down today to know that I'm a child of God. And I can put the mark, the watermark upon my life to say, that this day, I dedicated myself to follow after Christ, not only in my life, but also in my testimony, that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that I'm not ashamed to stand up and be identified with the body. Lord, we thank you for that. Be with us today. Convict us where we need conviction. Bless us upon our faithfulness to you. Guide us every day of our life. Allow the Holy Spirit of God to manifest himself real within our life and direct us in every step of our life. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I'd like to ask you something today. If, if you would, there's a card in front of you. And if you made a commitment today, made a commitment to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you've never been baptized, or you've been baptized in the improper order, you were baptized as a child. And then maybe when you were 17, 18 years of age, you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let me tell you what you were doing when you were 7 or 8. You were taking a bath. And maybe in front of a bunch of people, but you were just taking a bath. Because a baptism has to be in the proper order. And the proper order is, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And then I follow him in believer's baptism. So maybe you were a child. Maybe your parents told you you had to get baptized. Maybe you were baptized into a church, but you didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I would like for you to place on that card that you would like, if you would like to, that you would like to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And then we would get a hold of you this week and talk to you about a time where we could have a baptismal service and that we can set apart a service for baptism to identify our bodies into Christ. I love the picture of the Trinity. Do I understand the Trinity? No. But I know the Trinity exists because God the Son was baptized. God the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove and rested upon his shoulder. And he gave him power to live his life for the next three and a half years into the Holy Spirit's power to be successful. And I loved when God said, this is my Son whom I'm well pleased. The first step of obedience is saying, Holy Spirit, I need you to guide me. And the greatest thing that we could ever hear, God saying, I'm well pleased. You're doing exactly what I want you to do. I want to give you the favor of God upon your life and allow God to work within you. Put that on your card. We will get a hold of you. We'll schedule a baptism. There's not a greater thing that you can do is to accept Jesus as your Lord and follow him in a commitment of baptism to consecrate your life for your future ministry. Okay? God bless you. Pastor Al.